Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Next Generation Workshop. My name is Federica Rallarche, and I'm a one, I am one of the organizers of this event, together with my colleague, Giorgia Santamaria, who I want to thank profoundly for the great support in making this event possible. I am very pleased and honored to open today's meeting on behalf of the Institute of Stare Internazionali and the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the consortium, which is the ultimate organizers of this event, the consortium um, is composed by six European think tanks and organizations, namely La Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique in Paris, the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt, the Institute of Stare Internazionali in Rome, the IISS of London, the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, and City of Stockholm. The role of the consortium is to organize and coordinate the activities of the UMPD network, a network established in 2010 through a council decision, and that is now composed by over 100 institutes all over Europe. It is safe to say that the network represents the vast majority of EU think tanks that cover topics related to arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament, not only of weapons of mass destruction, but also delivery systems, conventional weapons, including small arms and light weapons, and topics related to cyber and space security. Now that I gave you a little bit of a background information on the organizers of this event, let's talk about this workshop. The first thing that I really would like to do is to congratulate all the candidates who have sent an application to this year's edition of the workshop, both those who have been selected and those who have not been selected as speakers this time. I want to congratulate you all because the selection process this year was particularly difficult. I must admit that at the very beginning we were worried that due to the virtual format of the workshop, this year we were not going to receive a lot of applications. Let's be honest, we all know that the coolest part of these events is to be flown to different cities or different countries and meet people who are interested in the same weird things that you're interested in, like weapons of mass destruction. But this was not the case this year. We have received a large number of highly motivated candidates and highly impressive resumes and proposals, which truly made our selection process a headache. To give you some numbers, we have received over 50 applications from 26 different countries, and the majority of which were from young women, which is extremely, which is an extremely encouraging data, considering that this field has been highly male-dominated for a very, very long time. So it was hard to pick. Um, and that's why I would like to give a round of applause to those who have been selected as speakers, but also another one to those who have not been selected this time. And particularly to this last group that I have mentioned that we have decided to invite at attendees anyways because of the quality of their applications and also to other participants who are um, attended in uh, attendees capacity. I, re I really would like to encourage you to take advantage and make the best use of the Q&A and discussion sessions. Please use this time to comment on your peers' work, provide feedback on your peers' presentation, and above all, to propose new ideas and, and views, because this is really what the workshop is about. It's about providing and um, improving and growing as an expert and brainstorming together to find solutions to the challenges of this field, solutions that the generation before us have tried to find with limited luck. And I must say the digital format with, was a blessing in this sense because it gave us the opportunity to open the workshop to a wider participation. We are very happy to have over 100 participants registered this year. 43 attendees and nine panelists at the moment, which at 9 a.m. it's a big accomplishment, I must say. Um, whereas last year we only had around 30 participants in total. So this is definitely a good sign. And this takes me to the last part of my already too long remarks. We really tried our best to use an interactive platform and to keep the networking experience of in-person conferences possible during this workshop as well. And we really wanted to give the opportunity to every single one of you to actively participate in this workshop, preventing it from being just another event that you passively watch without really having the possibility con to contribute to the discussion. So as you've probably seen during the, uh, in the guidelines that we've sent you, 
Through the platform, you will be able to schedule one-on-one multilateral, one -on -one or multilateral video meetings, just like an in-person event. And this not only during the sessions, I hope you won't do it during the session, but also during the break, and this evening and possibly also tomorrow. But you will also have different ways to contribute to the discussion during sessions by asking questions in both in a written format, if you wish, by typing them in the Q&A box next to the participant in the bottom of the um, video, or by raising your hand your hand virtually in case you wanted to ask questions or make comments in video. Should that, should that be your preferred way to contribute to the discussion, please make sure that you turn on your mic once the chair gives you the floor. And for chairs, I would recommend to keep an eye on both the chat, the Q&A, and the list of participants for raised hands. And with this last piece of information, please allow me to welcome you once again um, to this virtual edition of the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Next Generation Workshop and to introduce our colleague from the European External Action Service, Eran Nagan. Eran, the floor is Ladies and gentlemen, um, and also on behalf of the AES, welcome to this Next Generation Workshop. It's an honor for me to be here among those many bright uh, minds. And it is indeed uh, with, with pleasure that I give you, that I intend to give you a brief overview of what our part of the European External Action Service, the Non-Proliferation and Disarmament and Export Control Division is working on right now, where we stand, um, and then also why it is so important that we hear your voices. Uh, apologies, first of all, for being a bit late in the event, but I think I heard most of your intervention, Federica, uh, and also apologies for having to leave at, at uh, a quarter to 10 because I have another meeting to open at 10 o'clock on export control outreach. So I'm, it's, a, it's a busy morning hopping from one virtual platform for, to the other. But also let, let me thank the, the consortium and IAI in particular uh, for the way that uh, Federica, you and your colleagues have picked up the, uh, with big, with a large amount of flexibility, uh, the organization of the several events, including this next generation uh, workshop, and turned it into uh, what I th what I'm sure will be a success, even in these uh, virtual conditions. And I'm very happy that you have the uh, a similar number of attendants that you that we would normally have had without the the perk of traveling to Brussels. Indeed, um, also Brussels is not that nice, to be honest. I can say after. <laughs> Well, I've lived years living here, but that's a different story. So um, we, where are we uh, globally you know, speaking in the field of uh, world weapons of mass destruction, non-proliferation and, and disarmament? So as, as I'm sure we can all agree, the system of multilateralism is under stress. Uh, we are in the midst of a pandemic which has economic uh, repercussions. Uh, we have other global threats that take center stage now, uh, such as climate change and the, and the global health crisis. Um, so the attention also for uh, WMD uh, could be, uh, has been definitely higher in, in the past. We have uh, our friends in Russia breaking certain treaties that they signed up to. We have uh, a US administration that as a consequence is withdrawing from these treaties such as the INF, but also uh, withdrawing from other treaties without a clear reason, such as the JCPOA agreement with Iran, the Open Skies Treaty, which is, of course, uh, a pity, uh, a shame from the European point of view. Uh, at the same time, we see all these tremendously fast technological advances, the introduction of AI in weapon systems and, and the unknown consequences of these trends. And the question is, are governments actually prepared um, and I think this is very much where, where you come in also, but I'll get back to that. Briefly, a couple of words on the non-proliferation treaty. The NPT, obviously, for the EU is still the, the, the bedrock of, uh, of nuclear non-proliferation. Um, the EU position and, and actions during the ongoing review cycle of the Treaty of Non-Proliferation uh, on the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons 
continues to be grounded in our conviction that a multilateral approach to security, including disarmament and non-proliferation, provides the best way to maintain international peace and security. Hence, the EU's commitment to uphold and strengthen the integrity of the NPT, promote its universalization, and, and, and enhance its implementation. Our main priority for 2021 is a successful outcome of the 10th MPT review conference, which, as you know, has again been postponed till, till next summer. Um, the extension of the new START treaty obviously is also essential for European security, and we continue to support it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a bi strategic bilateral treaty, um, which has its direct effects for, for Europe. Um, and following the demise of the INF Treaty, as I just mentioned, it, it it's, remains the, the only nuclear arms control agreement still in force, um, which makes it even more essential that we will have it extended. At least uh, these, these pros prospects are looking positive, so that's a, a, a positive point in, in a furthermore rather, further rather gloom uh, picture. On chemical weapons, I would like to say a couple of words as well. Um, as you know, there is a global global norm on non-use uh, enshrined in the Chemical Weapons Convention, um, but it is very much under attack, uh, especially since its use in the Syrian civil war several years ago. Um, now we are in a, facing a situation where the Russian Federation is actively undermining the credibility of the OPCW, the organization uh, which is the, uh, you know, the bedrock under the uh, CWC. The EU is very much uh, sticking its neck out and, and protecting the OPCW from these attacks and standing for its impartiality and professionalism. And it's important for, for the European Union to continue sending these clear messages in support of the OPCW and fight against impunity and also to help counter the, the Russian narrative that is basically there to, uh, to, 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 to sow doubt about the, the integ integrity of the organization. A couple of words on arms export control, which is um, my personal field uh, of work since I'm the chair of the uh, COARM, which is the arms export working group of the European Union. Um, here we see, <clears throat> of, uh, for those who are <laughs> aware of it, we, uh, there is a European framework in, in the common position on, on arms export control since 2008, which was reviewed last year, but basically remained the same. Uh, the, the eight criteria that are enshrined in that text are, are a clear um, framework for assessing export license applications by member states. This is still uh, a national uh, confidence in, in, in the way that member states take these decisions on export licenses. Uh, but of course, the legal framework is a European one. Um, following the um, Following the review of the common position, we have been working in the context of COARM on further convergence and increased transparency, um, especially now that the EU has, uh, that we have a European Commission with geopolitical ambitions. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mrs. van der Leyen who presents uh, the European Union as a, as a geopolitical player. I think it is important to realize that also in the terms of arms export control, uh, the member states need to move closer together and, and come to uh, really uh, similar risk analysis um, in order to have a consistent and, and more convergent policy of export control that, that is currently the, the case. Uh, so we are working on this and, and uh, step by step improving uh, the situation. Uh, including, for instance, by agreeing to uh, an end-use certificate for small arms and light weapons that will help uh, set European-wide uh, agreements on how such an end-use certificate should look like. Um, also, we made a major step in, in terms of transparency by uh, launching on the 26th of October, so a couple of weeks ago, one month ago, indeed, 
um, an arms export database uh, linked to the EAS website on which you can find all um, export control, arms export, conventional arms export control data uh, from all EU member states for the years 2013 to 2019. Uh, this is a tremendous step in increasing transparency. The data itself is not necessarily new because it was, uh, the, we had annual reports on arms exports every year. But um, these reports were this thick. Uh, basically, we, we call them the brick. It was uh, 500 pages of unreadable tables. Uh, and by now, we have a, a, a website with a pie chart with a map of the world on which you click on one country. And you can exactly immediately see, visualize from which European countries they receive uh, arms imports. Um, there is a you know there are graphs with the development throughout the year, so it is really a big improvement, I would say, and invite everybody to to take a look uh, at that. A couple of words briefly on impact of the emerging of emerging technologies on international security and arms control, which is actually your second panel this morning. Um, of course, we have uh, the ongoing discussion on, on lethal autonomous weapons systems in the CCW context in Geneva. Um, and it is important to see what kind of framework uh, we can uh, agree upon in this um, context in order to achieve meaningful human control. Um, but there is much more. There's the risk of cyber attacks leading to, to physical damage, uh, the, the, the easy escalation and actual disruption of, of physical institutions. So uh, particularly this area, I think, is one where uh, the EU is really interested in hearing your thoughts as, as experts and, and um, trying to make use of the knowledge of um, of people who are studying in this field and and also seeing where the opportunities lie um, in general we we this rather grim context and to 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 uh, finalize what what does the eu do uh, well, obviously, we employ diplomatic efforts as well as, as projects. We support projects in, in support of the multilateral framework, in support of uh, international organizations, UN, OPCW, CTBT, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the EU is still absolutely in, uh, internationally seen as an important player, as a norm setter. But maybe at this stage, uh, more is needed. And, and indeed, we should think about shift uh, in our thinking about uh, WMD and, and, for instance, new tech. Um, can new tech help us in, in for instance, improving the, the old ways of confidence building measures in increasing transparency? Uh, what opportunities are there for the application uh, of new tech in, in the field of non-proliferation and disarmament that could actually uh, help us create a, an environment where we can um, solve the, the current challenges in a, in a better way. So input again, and these are my last uh, words to you this morning, input from the scientific uh, community is extremely important. And we are very grateful that uh, the these young uh, bright minds come together and discuss how to tackle these immense challenges that I've tried to portray for you. Um, and just uh, as a matter of, of um, in fact, the world really needs your creative input, uh, and so do we. So we will be extremely interested in, in reading the reports from today's meetings and reading your, uh, your papers and your inputs and seeing what can be applied in, um, in our day-to-day -day work in trying to make the world slightly safer and uh, more stable. I'll leave it at that, Frederica, and I wish you a, a very productive day. And, and, and as I said, curious to hear the outcomes of today. Many, many thanks, Aram. Thank you also for this comprehensive overview of the field and the work of the EU. Um, again, thank you for making some time to welcome our participants, and we look forward to staying in touch. We will definitely keep you updated on the results of these meetings.